Okay, welcome to another Orbiter 2010 video. And in this video, I'm going to continue the Jupiter moon hopping series that I started. It's actually been, I think, three weeks, something like that, since I recorded the uh, the last hop, which was, uh, let's see, we started off on, what's the farthest one out? I don't remember the, the sequence of the planets. I think Callisto is the farthest that we went from so Callisto to Ganymede, then Ganymede to Europa. Yeah, I think that's right. So now we're going to go from Europa to Io, and that will finish off this particular series. And I really do believe that this series will be very helpful for people that are wanting to learn how to use IMFD to go from one body to another body that's orbiting the same parent. So in other words, we can use this to go from you know, like we're doing here around the moons of Jupiter, but you could also use this same technique to go from Earth to Mars. There's there's really no difference because, again, if we if we think of the Jupiter as just being the sun, then all we're doing is we're going from one planet to another here around Jupiter. So it's the same idea. Let's go ahead and uh, switch camera views here. And again, it's been it's been three weeks. You know, I think uh, it was I think it was March 10th or March 11th when I recorded the the last hop, and it's now April 1st, so happy April Fool's Day, everybody, though you won't see these videos until July or August, or who knows. But um, one comment I want to make right here at the start is that since it's been as long as it has, this information is no longer fresh in my mind. And this is kind of one of the points that I want to make about you know note taking and why I do these videos is because it's really fun to do this stuff and learn it, but it, it only you only retain it in your head for the for the period in which you're doing it. You know you're actively playing with Orbiter for a weekend, you learn a lot about it. It's great, but then something you know real life stuff happens and you you don't get back to it for a month or two. And when you come back to it, you're like, oh my god, I don't remember how to do anything. So that's why I'm a big fan of taking notes. And I'm a big fan of these types of videos that can help explain things so that you can watch it and just quickly refresh yourself. So that being said, I'm actually going to kind of go down my own notes as a, uh, as, a, as a checklist of sorts to help me remember exactly what I need to do. I've got a pretty good feel for IMFD at this point, so I don't really need them per se. But it's also good to go down that uh, list of notes that I made just to sort of check those items off one by one and uh, make sure the notes are good. So let's uh, check out the uh, notes here. Make sure everything's showing up okay. It looks it looks good in the video playback, I suppose. I have reformatted things a little bit. I added sort of a table of contents here at the beginning. And again, I haven't touched these notes since March 11th, and you can see down here it's April 1st. And a little disclaimer here, you know, these notes, uh, you know, basically, it, it just it's not completely everything you need to know. You kind of want to watch the videos and read the notes. So let's go through here, and I'm not necessarily going to read every single step, but if I get to a point where I'm not sure what I have to do next, I will come back here and refer to the notes. But I think I've pretty well got it under control at this point. And since we have two prior examples, you know, going from Callisto to Ganymede and then Ganymede to Europa, I don't really want to go into the notes so much. So we're going to bring IMFD up over here, menu, course target intercept and we need to be uh, we're already referencing Europa and I believe that is correct there is a there is a special situation that I want to talk about in another similar series that I want to do where I'm going to hop around some of the moons of Saturn I'm not going to do all of them because there's eight and it would be a very very long video series but there's a special case that I'll, I'll just briefly mention when you're on a body um, that has its gravity that's less than, you know, 0.5, then this will be red. And that actually presents a problem when you're trying to do this interplanetary hopping type of thing. So when you're, when you're at Saturn, some of those moons are so low in mass that, uh, that, the, that Saturn is actually the dominating gravitational influence and not the body that you're on. And that actually creates a bit of a problem. But that's not an issue here, so we won't talk about it. But I just wanted to kind of plant that seed of knowledge so that if you if you experiment with this and you put your vessel on uh, one of the inner moons of Saturn and you, and you try to go through these steps, you're not going to have much success because you're going to find that um, the gravitational influence of the body that you're on, the moon that you're on, is so low 
that basically it uh, confuses interplanetary MFD for lack of a better explanation. But again, that's not an issue here. We're on Europa, has plenty of mass so that it's the dominating body. So we're good. So reference, uh, referencing Europa, that's correct. And now we want to target the next uh, moon, which is going to be Io. And uh, as before, you know, I, interplanetary MFD gives us some kind of solution. And we can see down here that our OV, and uh, it would be 2.6 uh, kilometers per second in our IV, which would basically be our breaking berm once we get there, is going to be about 4.2 kilometers per second. And uh, Demetri gave me a good way to think about the OV and the IV. If we think of the OV as outbound and the IV as inbound. So oh, this is our outbound. This is what it's going to cost us to go out from Europa. And then the inbound, the inbound velocity is going to be what it's, uh, what it's going to cost us to break once we get there. And it's always important to pay attention to these as separate numbers in the event that you're going to a body that has an atmosphere. Like if we were on Saturn, uh, the moons of Saturn, and we're going to Titan, since Titan has such a thick atmosphere, we could actually mostly ignore the inbound velocity because we would be able to use the atmosphere of Titan as a break. So we would really want to focus solely on getting the best OV that we could and really not even look at the total. But in this case, we're going to Io, and Io does not have uh, any kind of atmosphere to speak of. I mean, there's, I think there's volcanic activity or something, but it's not enough to, to present uh, any any kind of atmospheric breaking solution, so we can't we just we would just want to look at the total. So first step here, we're going to go to the uh, time of flight. We're going to lock it. Then we're going to come back to the MJD. And again, when the time of flight's locked, you can change the MJD here or here. It, it, it's the same since they're locked. They're both changing in, in equal amounts. So I believe in the last video we changed this one. So in this one, we'll change this one just to be different, just to show that it's just to show that, uh, you know, just to show that you can use either one. So let's go forward by, you know, just at 1x. And you can see we've dropped our total down by, uh, you know, over 1,500 just by going forward by, you know, 8,000 seconds. Let's just keep going. And we see when we get around here at 4055 that uh, if I go backwards, it's more. And if I go forward from that point, it's more. And this looks like a pretty good Hamann transfer. Let me kind of see how things are looking. We are here. And I'm guessing we would leave here, orbit around, and arrive at that on that side. So yeah, that would basically be you know a good Hamann transfer. Now, um, what we want to do is, uh, before we unlock, it's also not a bad idea to come to the TIN or TEJ because Again, I, I've used this analogy before. I'll use it again. When you're adjusting the MJD at 1x, this is kind of like adjusting uh, in transx using maybe like fine. And if you adjust the MJD at 10x, then it's kind of your medium setting. And if you adjust the MJD at 100x, then this is like uh, coarse or maybe even rough. But when we go to the TIN and we make adjustments here, this is getting down into your ultra super hyper uh, micro type of stuff so we with at a 1x setting we're really not changing much at all so we probably want to start with at least 10x maybe even a hundred and let's just go forward or backwards and see what happens you can see that's terrible so let's go back and let's go to a finer adjustment so let's go 10 instead of 100 and going forward is not helping you can see that's just going up and let's try backwards and we're getting a little bit of improvement by going backwards quite a bit of improvement actually so we'll just keep going backwards until it's at its lowest point. We've already saved over 100 delta V. That's that's significant. That's nothing to, uh, you know, nothing to scoff at. So continuing to go backwards, and now we've reached that point where it's starting to go back up. So uh, total 3.853 is what we think is going to be our best. Now we want to uh, unlock the uh, time of flight. And now we can play around a little bit more with uh, with these four variables, or two, these two sets of variables, and see if we can drive it down even lower. Now that it's unlocked, we're saying that if we just adjust the, the time of arrival without changing the departure time, will it, will it improve our total delta V? And most likely it will to some extent, so let's try that. 
So going positive is not, and going backwards a little bit, that's bringing it down slightly. It's not having a huge improvement, but a couple of meters per second. And once you get some improvement on one side, you always want to check the other side as well. What happens if we leave a little bit earlier or a little bit later? Well, let's find out. So if we leave a little bit later, you can see we're saving a few meters per second. And anytime you change the time that you're leaving or the time that you're arriving and you're getting some kind of improvement, you always want to go back and check the other side also. So let's just find the lowest number here. And it looks like 3819 is going to be the lowest. Yep, it's the lowest. So now let's check again on the other side. Go back and forth. And that's having a, you know, that's a good improvement. You know, that's uh, 20, 30 meters per second. So 70, uh, 783 is the lowest, lowest that I saw. Check the other side. Coming down a little bit. It's definitely getting to that point where we're not getting much benefit by changing things. So it's, it's kind of bottoming out. Okay, that's the low point. Check the other side. Low point again, and continue just to back, go back and forth until you have the absolute lowest. Or, you know, if you get to a point where you decide, uh, I'm not concerned about saving one more meter per second, then of course you can quit. But you can see it doesn't take very long to just, you know, find that absolute lowest number. And it looks like a 752 is going to be that number. Now what we can do is we want to make a note of what our velocities are here. Uh, it's, part, it's really just the total, but you may want to go ahead and write them down separately. OV, I'm just going to put 1.724. IV is 2.028. And finally, the total, total is 3.752. All I want to know is can I beat that number significantly if I wait a little, if I go out a little bit farther into the future. So let's go back to uh, time of flight and let's lock it. So now anything that I change on this side will be equal on that side. That makes it very easy to, to go forward in time and then quickly come back to where I'm at right now. Okay, so going to uh, the T, uh, the MNJD rather, and doing a 1x adjustment, let's just go forward and find the next time where we get this type of solution. You can see the total is definitely not helping here, but you know we've got to go around a bit. Okay, we're getting back to that point where where we're basically where exactly where we were before, so it doesn't really look like we're going to get any improvement. Uh, one thing we can do is we can test where we're leaving and when we're arriving at our target uh, by checking the line of nodes. And you can't see that in Interplanetary MFD. So if you bring up Transex, and we're not actually going to use Transex, but we're just going to see where the line of nodes is at. If we target Escape and then go over here to IO, and then press VW to bring up the eject plan, and just put in one tap of any, of any velocity, it doesn't matter where it's at. And that just shows us where the line of nodes is at. And we can use that line drawing tool that I like to use, but we really don't have to. We can see that the line of nodes starts here on this button at about the bottom of it, crosses over to there, and we can we can figure that out over here. So the line of nodes, if we were to if we were to superimpose this line of nodes over here, it would start about right there and cut across to about here. So we are not arriving exactly at the line of nodes because uh, we're arriving here, which is a bit past it, but it's pretty close. So we may be able to find a, a better solution out into the future if we if we arrived closer to this point. Now, if we're, if we're really curious and we want to find out, we can just go forward a bit like this, and we're getting close to that point. So now kind of watch things here. Now, it looks like actually each time we go around, we're getting farther from the line of nodes. So we would probably have to go forward by, you know, I don't even know, 20 orbits or, you know, 20, 20 times that Io would have to go around Jupiter in order, to, in order for that to match up. And if you want to do that, that's fine. In this, in this case, I'm not going to do that. So we're just going to back up to our 3752 point. 
and we're going to take that because I don't think it's going to get a whole lot better than that. Okay, we're almost there, and there we are. Okay, so now we have uh, we have our we have everything set up, and our TEJ is only thirty thousand. It's not you know three hundred thousand or something like that. In the event that your TEJ is really high, you know, like you're not leaving for several weeks or months, you're going to want to uh, use the date editor or, you know, warp time forward to get much closer to the TEJ and then check everything out again. Because as you know, uh, the, the, the farther in advance you set this kind of stuff up, the more inaccurate it is. And then once you actually get closer to that date, you're going to find that the numbers that you come up with are off by some amount, even with IMFD. Okay, so let's uh, let's check the notes here because I, I know what to do next, but I just kind of want to see what I've got here in my notes. Okay, alternating back and forth. If a departure date is greater than one day, that's kind of where we're at right now. Okay, then once you have the lowest dB, go to the MJD of departure and arrival in advance time forward. Okay, all right, that's kind of where we're at. So next next thing we want to do is set up the surface launch. So we're going to bring up Interplanetary MFD on this side menu, and we need to share this side with that side. So we, in other words, we need this side to get its data from here. So we're going to uh, share side one and bring up Surface Launch. And I don't think I have to target anything. Let me check my notes again. It's three weeks of uh, not doing this. So load the Surface Launch program and make sure that it's set to Op Mode Course Program. Okay, Op Mode is Course Program. Make sure the reference body is the body you are currently landed on and target is none. And the reference body is Europa and the target is none. And I remember putting that in the notes because when I was playing around with this, again, on the moons of Saturn, some of those moons are so small that when you bring up Surface Launch, you're going to see that your reference is actually the, the parent planet and not the body that you're on. So it's important to make sure, uh, if you're going to use the surface launch, it's important to make sure that you're referencing the correct body. Now we need to set the target orbital altitude. This technically isn't required, but we can do it. There's no, probably no good reason not to. I usually go for 20 kilometers around the moon, but I think I like 30, 40, maybe even 50 around some of these smaller moons a little bit more. So let's go set, let's go 30K. And now we are, uh, the right time to launch is determined by two factors. Okay, so the surface launch program is telling us that we have, we can have a launch heading of 90 degrees exactly if we leave when the uh, time is, is 81,000 seconds from now. Unfortunately, that puts us 50,000 seconds past the TEJ, so that's not really going to work. If we leave right now, we can have a heading of 92.5 degrees, but if we leave right now, we're leaving 30,000 seconds too soon, and that's not going to work either. So we, uh, we're going to have to just take whatever heading we have when we are closer to the time to launch. And that's not, that's not actually all that bad, because if you... I made this chart to show... I think this is the right chart. Yeah, this, this is the one that shows the rotational velocities of the different bodies. On Earth, the rotational velocity at KSC is about 408 meters per second. So that means if you take off and head in the wrong direction, then you have you're losing all that 400. You're 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 costing yourself more delta v than you really have to. On Europa, the rotational velocity is only 31 meters per second. That's that's significant. That's not significant, but it's it's enough that we would like to take advantage of it if, if we could but it's not so high that we necessarily have to worry about it. It's really nice on the moon because your rotation, the rotational velocity of the moon is only 3.5 meters per second. So that's nothing. It doesn't matter which way you go on the moon. You're not really losing any delta V. So here on Europa, if we end up taking off and flying, you know, worst case scenario, 270 degrees, then we're losing, I believe, I, I think it's actually 31 meters per second times two because not only are we losing the forward um, forward velocity, but we're actually going backwards. So I, th I think it might be a times two. I'm not 100% sure on that. But at the very least, we're losing 31 meters per second. And again, that's not a huge number, but if, 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 it's, if it's possible to take off 
and fly at a heading of 90 degrees, that's always ideal. Now we need to uh, warp time forward until the uh, TEJ is just a couple thousand seconds, I believe. Let me check my notes on that. Yeah, setting up surface launch. So we want to, uh, oh yeah, the TEP value, I kind of I completely forgot about that. Yeah, the TEP, this, this is an undocumented, um, an undocumented uh, variable given to us in IMFD. Uh, Dimitri told me that he's looked everywhere for what TEP means. It's nowhere in the documentation that comes with IMFD, and it's nowhere, it's not mentioned anywhere in the, uh, in the extra documentation that was written by Tommy and, I forget the other guy's name, Mark, I think, Tommy and Mark. And Dimitri thinks this basically means uh, time... Let me find out exact time to eject point. So, in other words, it, we just as it, it's not exact. He he's found in his own testing that it's not exact. But when we warp time forward, we want to. Uh, this gives us a good starting point, if nothing else. So, in other words, the the eject point, the time to eject is in thirty thousand seconds. But the eject, the time to the eject point, how long it's going to take us to get from where we are to the eject point is this number. So in other words, we want to warp time forward until the TEJ closely matches this number, and then we're going to take off. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that now. Just warping time forward at 1,000, let's go 10,000. Careful not to overshoot. Now we're down to 9,000. And you can see actually the TEP is changing a little bit, so we'll keep an eye on that. But basically when we're at about 5,000 seconds, that's when it's going to be time to go. Oh, and I, and I overshot. Uh, it's not by a significant amount, though. I've only overshot by 100 seconds or so. So we're going to go ahead and go. And now we're going to have a heading of 112.74, so not too bad. All right, let me uh, go down to 0 0.1 for a moment just while I think about some stuff. Okay, we do have the PEA and APA here. Let me change the projection because otherwise it's going to be weird. So we're going to hover up. We need to go to 112.75. And I'm never very good at figuring out which way is the shortest, so 270 is exactly west. But we are, I think, and we're a little bit northwest. And the heading is a little bit south uh, southeast, so I don't think it actually matters. I'm not sure if one way is going to be shorter than the other. There's got to be a way to figure that out, though. Let's see, 290. What if I take 290 minus 112? That'd be 178 degrees. That's if I go. That's if I go, I believe, to the left. So if I go the other way, it would be like 184 degrees or 182 degrees. So technically, it's a little bit. It makes almost no difference, but technically, it's a little bit shorter if I get up and rotate to the left. Okay. So time to go. Let's do this. Hover up. Raise the landing gear. Rotation. Go to rotation, and let me bring that hover down a bit, because that's... Gear up. Just going to watch my altitude here. If it starts to slow down, I'll put in some more hover. That's... need a bit more hover, I can tell. A little bit more, because now we're going down. A little bit more, there we go. And we're going around to 112, basically 113. I'm watching that altitude just to make sure that I don't drop or don't climb too fast. Okay, here we are. We're about 115, so we want 112.87. So that's about 114. That's about 113, so we want to be just a little bit on that side. All right. Full power on the main. Kill all the hover. Pitch up just a tad to keep that velocity vector above the horizon. I think I also have in my notes what the orbital velocity is for each of these uh, bodies. Let me check real quick. Just as a, yeah, average orbital velocity for for Europa is basically, it's pretty close to what it is on the moon. It's going to be 1421. That just gives you an idea of when you're going to, you know, when you're going to cut the engines, although we have that 
we have the information we need here. You know what I'm not looking at? I'm not looking at the EIN. I need to be looking at that. So if I put in a bit of, that's the wrong way. Put in a bit of right yaw to bring down that EIN. Put in a bit more because we're not far away from orbital velocity and I don't want to be this far off. Oh my gosh, somehow I really messed up on the uh, heading. I, I must have, I wasn't, I don't know what I was looking at on the heading, but I wasn't looking at the right thing. Okay, so we're going to be 1.6 degrees out of alignment. That's unfortunate. A little bit more uh, main engine to bring up the APA because we want a target of 30. And I'm sure whoever was watching the uh, video playback noticed that I was not at the right heading, but whatever. Translation. Okay, so we have our we have our target altitude. Switch over to the uh, orbit HUD. Now we need to. We're done with surface launch. Now we need to copy our our plan. Think about this for a second. Menu, we need orbit eject now. And we want to connect it to the course program. And I'm going to change the projection. And with the orbit eject program, we, we can tell how far away we are from the time to do the eject. And we can also tell, you know, if we're going to get to apoapsis first or not. And in this case, we are. So the first order of business here is going to be to warp time forward and circularize our orbit. This is where we are at in our orbit around Europa, this green line, and this is the eject point. Obviously we orbit in this direction, and that bubble is where apoapsis is at. So we're going to reach that point, and then we're going to start falling back down. Technically we would not hit the ground, it doesn't look like, but nevertheless, if you reach apoapsis prior to the eject point you always want to circularize. I can't think of any good reason not to do that. So the next order of business then is going to be to circularize. And I will go back to my notes here just for a moment because I think I drew, yeah, I put in a bunch of pretty pictures here into my notes to show this point for setting up orbit eject. After uh, achieving orbital velocity, you know, bring up orbit eject up, up on the side that had surface launch, which is what we just did. And then in this explanation here, I'm showing that if our current position is like that and the eject point is here, then we don't have to circularize because we reach the eject point before apoapsis. But if we have this case, which is more like what we have here, where this is our current position, that's the eject point and the apoapsis is here, then we're going to reach apoapsis before we get to the eject point, in which case we need to circularize. And that's what we have to do here. We are close to 30 minutes on this part of the video though, so I will save the circularization and ejection for the next part of the video. If you like this video, like it, and if you didn't like it, then don't like it. Leave comments down below, which is more important than more likes and dislikes. And I will put uh, links in the description down below, links to the uh, documentation that I worked on, and uh, just any other links that I can think of that might be important. So check that out, and I will see you in the next part.